Council. On April 11th of 2007, the defendant picked up his daughter, Ada, from school. Ada was six years old and in kindergarten, and the two of them went back home to the McNeil family home in Pleasant Grove, Utah. Like many young children, Ada went to look for her mom. Shell McNeil, who is also the defendant's wife. Ada found her mom unresponsive in the bathtub and ran to get the defendant. The defendant came in and saw Michelle in the tub. Ada ran to the neighbor's house to get help, and the defendant called 911. But this case starts a year and a half before April 11th of 2007, when the defendant met this person, Gypsy Willis. The two of them met online, and initially the relationship consisted of electronic communication and meeting for meals, but eventually the relationship became romantic and sexual in the beginning months of 2006. <clears throat> the defendant's relationship with Gypsy Willis continued as an affair into 2007. Around this same time, the defendant began to display health symptoms and talk about serious health ailments that he had, attending church and announcing in church that he had been diagnosed with terminal cancer and had a year to live. While sharing this, the defendant and Michelle wept. While visibly distraught, the defendant stated that he was going to have to teach Michelle how to take care of the family finances. The defendant had previously shared that he had a foot ailment and had started to use a cane. Despite these health issues, he was working on the family home and was seen hauling sheetrock into the house. Around the same time, early 2007, the defendant began to look into plastic surgery for Michelle McNeil for her to get a facelift and selected a surgeon named Dr. Scott Thompson, and the couple met with Dr. Thompson and decided on what procedures would be done. Dr. Thompson will tell you that in these meetings, the defendant was the dominant spouse. The surgery was scheduled for April 3rd of 2007 and was arranged at a time that the defendant and Michelle's daughter, Alexis, could come home from medical school to help with taking care of Michelle. Because Michelle was going to be having surgery, she needed to be cleared by a doctor and approved healthy enough for the surgery. As a result, the defendant contacted an associate and friend, Dr. Von Welch, who is a doctor of internal medicine, and requested that Dr. Welch perform a pre-operative exam on Michelle. Dr. Welch had worked with the defendant in admitting patients from the Utah State Developmental Center where the defendant was a medical doctor and the director, uh, the medical director. Dr. Welch had seen the defendant work and was impressed by his ability to appropriately balance and fine-tune the administration. I'm sorry, I hesitate to, to object to an opening statement, but I believe that, that where Mr. T is going is, is, is inappropriate. How so? What's your legal objection? Maybe Do you have a legal objection? Yes. What is it? It's, he's approaching a irrelevant and uh, inadmissible. Uh, it's relevance? Well, it's, it's um, relevance as, as well as um, 403. Approach.
Thank you, Council. Uh, Mr. Peed, you may continue. Dr. Welch had seen the defendant work and was impressed by his ability to appropriately balance and fine tune the administration of medications. Dr. Welch agreed to see Michelle as a new patient and an appointment was scheduled for March 29th of 2007. The defendant expressed eagerness to Dr. Welch to have the examination completed without any hiccups so that the surgery could go forward as scheduled. During this appointment, Dr. Welch was having a hard time communicating with Michelle because the defendant was butting in and answering for her. So he asked the defendant to step out so he could talk with Michelle alone. While examining Michelle, Dr. Welch learned that she had high blood pressure. And though high blood pressure was not a reason that the surgery could not go forward, Dr. Welch recommended to the defendant and to Michelle that the surgery be postponed until a time that she could have her blood pressure completely under control. The defendant was disappointed with this recommendation and Dr. Welch assumed that the surgery would not be going forward. After meeting with Dr. Welch, a final pre-operation consultation was held with Dr. Thompson on April 1st of 2007. Michelle, the defendant, and their daughter Alexis attended this consultation. On the way to this final appointment, Michelle expressed to the defendant that she wanted to have the surgery postponed so that she could lose weight and get her blood pressure under control. The couple argued about this and the defendant announced that the surgery was already paid for, was already scheduled, and that she was going to do it as scheduled. Prior to this final cons consultation, Alexis had seen the defendant combing through a dusty and little used copy of the physician's desk reference or the PDR. Alexis, who was an aspiring medical student and future doctor, asked the defendant what he was doing. The defendant stated that he wanted to make sure that any drugs given to Michelle did not interact poorly with each other and did not pose a danger to Michelle. Normally, Dr. Thompson would prescribe Lortab, Phenagran, and Ambien to help with recovery from this kind of procedure. However, at the final consultation on April 1st of 2007, and after the defendant had been reading in the PDR, the defendant asked Dr. Thompson to also prescribe Percocet and Valium. Dr. Thompson did agree to prescribe all five of these drugs to Michelle but did so because her husband was a doctor and was her primary care physician and would know how these drugs should be properly administered. He also did so with the understanding and knowledge that these medications were not to be taken altogether. After this final pre-operation consultation, Michelle received final clearance to go forward with the surgery from her primary care physician the defendant. On April 3rd of 2007, the defendant and Michelle and Alexis went to the hospital for the surgery. The surgery started in the morning and lasted between eight and nine hours. Alexis stayed with her mother during the surgery while the defendant left. After the surgery, Dr. Thompson came out and announced that it was a success and that everything had gone well. The defendant came back to the hospital and wanted to take Michelle home that night. Michelle was groggy and in pain. Her eyes were covered with bandages and she ended up staying in the hospital that first night to the defendant's disappointment. Alexis ended up staying that night with her mother in the hospital and the next day Michelle was brought home and the defendant had a hospital bed brought in for her to recover on. 
Michelle's eyes were bandaged due to the incisions that were made during the surgery and she was reliant on whoever would be taking care of her. So Alexis continued to stay by her mother's side and would rest herself near Michelle's bed. On the first night that Michelle was home, April 4th of 2007, the defendant told Alexis to go sleep downstairs because he was going to take care of Michelle that night. Alexis did not want to leave her mom, but the defendant insisted that she go to bed in her room. During the late night hours of April 4th and the early morning hours of April 5th, the defendant and Gypsy Willis exchanged 14 text messages. The following morning, Alexis got up and came into her mother's room to check on her and immediately noticed that Michelle was very sedated and that she would not wake up. Alexis asked the defendant what he had given her. He stated that he had probably over-medicated her. Alexis was upset and reasserted that she would be the one taking care of Michelle and also began to track all of the food, beverages, medications, and other things consumed by Michelle in addition to taking her vitals and she recorded all of this information in a little book she kept near Michelle's bed. As a result of the medications she had been given, by the defendant, Michelle was sedated for much of the day and uh, asleep often during this first full day home. But her condition began to improve that night and after becoming more lucid, lucid enough to meaning, meaningfully communicate, Michelle told Alexis that the defendant continued to give her drugs and told her to swallow. She also said that she had thrown up. She asked Alexis to help her feel the pills so that she would know which was which if she was given them in the future. A few days later, Alexis overheard her mother and the defendant fighting about Gypsy and how Michelle was not going to let this go. Michelle demanded to see the defendant's call records. The defendant attempted to skirt the issue by talking about how they should go on a cruise. On April 10th of 2007, Alexis took Michelle to a follow-up appointment with Dr. Thompson, who said she was doing great and recovering just fine. At this point, Michelle was taking only one to two Percocet pills per day and was not using the other medications and to Alexis's knowledge, had never used Ambien during her recovery. The family went out to dinner and then dropped Alexis off at the airport to return to medical school. On the following day, April 11th of 2007, Alexis called her mother from Nevada to make sure th everything was okay. Michelle was feeling fine and spoke about her plans for the day pick up Ada from school and to take some of the other girls to ballet. A short time later, Alexis received an unexpected and uncharacteristic call and message from the defendant suggesting that Michelle was not listening to him, was getting out of bed, and that he was worried she was doing too much. As a result, Alexis tried to call her mother, making calls between classes and was unable to get her mother on the phone. At around noon, Mountain Standard Time, she called the home again. The defendant answered the phone and told Alexis that Michelle was unconscious in the tub and that he was doing CPR and had called 911. Alexis immediately left school and ran to the airport. Earlier that morning, the defendant had gone to work at the Utah State Developmental Center in American Fork and had interacted with a number of people. 
he had made a couple of calls from his work phone to Gypsy Willis at 648 and 926 a.m. Later that morning, he had run into Gayla Moore and, a, and appeared to be in a rush, which was uncharacteristic for him. The defendant told Gayla that he had to get to the safety fair. Melissa Frost, another employee at the Utah State Developmental Center, was running the safety fair and said the defendant was not there except around 11 a.m. in order to accept an award and said that normally he did not care about the safety fair that the developmental center put on annually. The defendant eagerly told David Laycock, another employee, that he needed to have his picture taken. You will hear from the state's investigator that the defendant made phone calls from the Utah State Developmental Center at 6.48 a.m., 8.10 a.m., and then a few calls between 9.11 a.m. and 9.26 a.m. You will also hear from him that travel time from the Utah State Developmental to the McNeil House takes anywhere from 3 minutes and 7 seconds to 7 minutes and 23 seconds depending on speed and traffic conditions. You will also hear that the time it takes to get from the McNeil home to Ada's school is somewhere between 4 minutes and 52 seconds and 5 minutes and 1 second. It was less than an hour after the defendant attended the safety fair that he called 911 while Ada ran to the neighbors to get help. Police department. Okay, what's the problem, sir? Sir, what's wrong? I'm falling in the bathtub. Who's in the bathtub? Who's in the bathtub? My wife. Okay, is she conscious? She's not. She's not put on a position. Okay, sir. Sir, I need you to calm Sir, I, I can't understand you, okay? Can you calm down just a little bit? Help. Okay, what, your wife is unconscious? She is unconscious. She's in the water. Okay, did you, did you get her out of the water? I can't. I couldn't let the water out. She's on the water. She's under the water? She is out of the water now. The woman was in the ambulance. Okay, is she breathing at all? She is not. Okay, sir, the ambulance has been paged. They're on their way, okay? Do she not hang up. Her. What? No, that one didn't. Why would it? Why would an adult? Why would an adult female be so? Hello. Sir, this is nine one one. Can I help you? I need help. Okay, sir. Saying. They're on their way. Is your wife breathing? She is not. I am a physician. I got CPR in progress. Do You're doing understand? CPR. Do you know? No, no, no. Sir, how old is your wife? My wife is 50 years old. She just had surgery here a couple of days a week ago. What kind of surgery did she have? She had a facelift. She had a facelift? Yes. Okay, do you know how to do CPR? I'm doing it. Okay, do not hang... Emergency and law enforcement personnel were dispatched to the McNeil home at around 11.48 a.m. and arrived at around 11.55 a.m. They did have a little issue getting there because of how the defendant stated the address of the home. While emergencies, emergency responders were being summoned, Ada was able to get a neighbor, Christy Daniels, to come over and help. When she came in the house, she heard the defendant yelling and followed his voice back to the master bathroom where Michelle was in the bathtub. The 
The bathtub was drained but was wet. Michelle was on her back and her head was up near the faucet with her legs inside of the tub. She was only partially dressed. Michelle had a lot of mucus-like substance around her nose and face. The defendant was wearing a white lab coat and hovering over the bathtub. The defendant said that he had already called 911, but that he needed help. Christy ran to get another neighbor, neighbor, Angie Aguilar, to come over and help. Within about 30 seconds, Christy and Angie were back in the bathroom. And Christy had called her husband, told him to hurry over. Christy and Angie offered to help Michelle, offered to help the defendant get Michelle out of the tub. The defendant rejected their offer and stating that he needed a man's help. The defendant was pacing and exclaiming, Oh my God, oh my God. A short time later, Doug Daniels came running into the house, and he and the defendant took Michelle out of the tub and placed her on the tile floor of the bathroom. Michelle's skin was very pale and white. Christie began doing chest compressions while the defendant did mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. After a few attempts, Doug took over the chest compressions. During this initial attempt at CPR, no witness saw any mucus transfer from Michelle's face to the defendant's face or saw Michelle's chest rise. The defendant began to shout, Why would you do such a thing? All this for a stupid surgery? I told her not to do it. Why did you have to have this surgery? As the defendant said this, he hit Michelle's chest. Just as this happened, patrol officers Motzinger and Ormond came into the master bedroom and then master bathroom and took over CPR. The bathroom was narrow, so they moved her into the bedroom onto the carpeted area and continued resuscitation efforts. Michelle was still very white and cold, but as they worked on her, her skin color began to change and the incisions above her eyes began to bleed evidencing that they were able to manually stimulate blood flow in her body through the use of CPR. They also began to hear gurgling, which meant that she had water inside of her stomach or lungs. While CPR was performed this time, Michelle began to throw up several cups of liquid that spilled onto Officer Armand and onto Officer Motzinger into his glove, onto his pants, into his boot and on the area by Michelle's head on the floor. Shortly after this, she expelled some bloody, frothy, thicker but liquid-like substance. While Michelle was being worked on, paramedics arrived and began other life-saving procedures including intubation and patches to check her vitals for signs of life. While all of these procedures were being employed, the defendant was acting extremely peculiar. He was yelling, he was screaming and shouting. He would not stay still. He commanded the emergency responders to do certain things and then demanded to know what they were doing. He also exclaimed, why did she have the surgery? Why did she take all those medications? I told her not to do it. I'm a doctor. She's dead. I've been a bishop. I pay tithing. And this is the way you repay me. The defendant's actions were extremely distracting to emergency responders and the fire chief Mark Sanderson had to ask the defendant to leave the area by Michelle and come with him. These medical professionals, despite many, many of them having years and years of experience, will tell you that they were extremely taken aback by the defendant's behavior, especially since he was also a medical professional. 
Some of them were even concerned for their own safety. While this was going on, the defendant began to offer explanations as to what had happened. He remarked that he had only left Michelle for a few minutes to go and run an errand and came back and found her face down in the tub stating that she was slumped over the edge of the tub when he found her. You will hear that no other witness saw Michelle slumped over the edge of the tub with her face down inside of it. He suggested that she took too much medication due to her recent surgery and must have fallen in the tub. Steve Mickelson an associate of the defendants at the Utah State Developmental Center also came to the home as emergency responders were there and as the defendant was on the phone with Lexus at around noon. The defendant handed the phone to Steve Mickelson and said, tell Alexis I can't. Mr. Mickelson then told Alexis that, his mother, that her mother was not doing well and that she should come home. Emergency personnel took Michelle to the American Fork Hospital where she was treated by Dr. Van Wagener and nurse Stephanie Hansen. She arrived there at around 12.25 p.m. At the hospital, the defendant continued to act very demonstratively, yelling and screaming while pacing about quickly, even kicking in anger. He continued to assert that he had told her not to do this, not to have the surgery. Dr. Van Wagner felt that Michelle, Michelle had coded or was dead before she was presented in the ER. There was no breathing, no pulse, and her skin was extremely cold. He also observed lividity on the back of her legs, evidencing that she'd been in a, on her back side for some time. The defendant again expressed concern that Michelle had taken too much medication and had passed out in the tub. He stated that he had pulled her out and started CPR. The defendant then told Dr. Van Wagner that he would pay him $10,000 not to cease resuscitation efforts and reasserted that he was against Michelle having the surgery and was worried she had taken too much medication. At 1.03 p.m., Michelle McNeil was officially pronounced dead. The defendant went back home, and soon after coming home, his son's girlfriend, Eileen Hang, came to the house. The defendant told Eileen that Michelle was wearing only a top when he and Ada had found her, leading him to believe that she might have been using the toilet at the time that she, before she was found. He went on to say that there was blood everywhere because Michelle had fallen and that she had not been taking her medication like she was supposed to. The defendant invited Eileen and his son Damien, who was Eileen's boyfriend to come into the master bedroom and said that they needed to account for all of Michelle's medications and that he needed to do that in front of someone. The defendant, who in addition to being a doctor is also a lawyer, explained that he wanted the pills disposed of because he did not want to see them anymore because he was concerned and felt that they had something to do with her death. A toxicological exam was later performed on Michelle's blood. Michelle was found to have Percocet, Valium, Phenergan, and Ambien in her system at the time of her death. After the pills were disposed of, because the defendant could not bear to look at them anymore, the defendant asked Eileen to help him clean the area up. Eileen noted that the carpeting was particularly wet in one location of the bedroom. She had flushed all of the pills at the defendant's direction to dispose of them. 
Rachel and Alexis McNeil, two daughters of the defendant and Michelle, though coming from different locations, rushed home to the McNeil home as fast as they could. Upon arriving, they could see that Michelle's get well gifts, decorative towels, prescription medications, the book Alexis had written down all of Michelle's vitals and consumables in, and Michelle's hospital bed had already been removed from the residence. This was the afternoon of Michelle's death. Alexis asked the defendant where her mother's medications were. The defendant remarked that the police must have taken them. Rachel found her mother's wet clothing and the defendant told her to discard this, but she did not. On the same afternoon, the defendant told Rachel and Alexis to come into the master bathroom so that he could demonstrate the position he had found Michelle in. Rachel did not want to see this, but the defendant insisted. The defendant draped himself over the edge of the tub with his head down in the tub and stated that he had tried to pull her out, but he was too weak. Rachel, concerned for the younger McNeil children, who are now without a mother, the children were Ada, Sabrina, Giselle, and Elle, told the defendant that she was going to quit her job and come home to take care of them. The defendant told her that she should not quit her job and that he was going to get a nanny. Despite this, Rachel quit her job and the defendant was livid with her for doing this. Another daughter, Vanessa McNeil, also volunteered to come home and help with the younger McNeil children. The defendant told her he was going to hire a nanny. Later that day, same afternoon of Michelle's death, the defendant expressed concern to Rachel that the police could come back to question him about Michelle's death because they might think that he killed her. He said he wanted an autopsy done on Michelle. The defendant later spoke with Dr. Maureen Fricke of the Utah Medical Examiner's Office on the phone. Dr. Fricke was assigned to perform Michelle's autopsy. The defendant described Michelle's body position in the same way he had demonstrated it to Rachel and Alexis, stating that Michelle was draped over the edge of the tub with her head face down in the tub. Again, you will hear that no other witness saw or described Michelle in this position. The defendant set Michelle's funeral for Saturday, April 14th of 2007. Prior to the funeral, the defendant was seen unloading boxes of Michelle's memorabilia and walking around without any difficulty. However, when following the casket, the defendant exhibited a profound limp and walked with a cane. When the defendant spoke at Michelle's funeral, he remarked how odd it was to be a bachelor again. After the funeral, the defendant was jovial, laughing and smiling, again remarking that he was going to have to get used to the life of a bachelor. One of Michelle's friends, Lanny Swallow, approached the defendant and offered to help take care of the younger McNeil children. The defendant declined the offer telling Lanny that he had already hired a nurse to be the children's nanny. Gypsy Willis attended the funeral and even sent the defendant three text messages during the funeral. The two of them exchanged over 20 text messages on the day of Michelle's funeral. The defendant went back to work very soon after Michelle's death and told various employees that he was doing fine and that things often happen for a reason, that he was okay and he would be okay. He was also wearing a different wedding band. And when asked about this different ring, he simply said that it was an old ring that he hadn't worn for a while. During the week following Michelle's death, the defendant and his daughter, Rachel, went to the Mount Timpanogos LDS Temple. The defendant said that they should go to the temple to pray about 
getting a nanny for the younger children. Rachel went to the temple and finished her worship services before the defendant. And so she went looking for him at the Utah State Developmental Center and then at their home. The defendant called her, angry that she had left, and told her to come back. Rachel came back and she and the defendant sat outside the temple to ponder on the question of a nanny. As they were sitting there, Gypsy Willis walked by and the defendant feigned. I'm sorry, I know you. What's your name? Gypsy stated that her name was Jillian. The defendant lied and said, now he remembered. The two of them had worked together. Later in the conversation, he again pretended to not know her name in asking, what was your name? She again responded, Jillian. The three of them talked about Gypsy being a nurse, and he and Gypsy suggested that Rachel should enroll in nursing school. The defendant asked Gypsy for her number, holding out this fabricated but seemingly happenstance meeting as an answer to prayer. And as though he did not already know Gypsy Willis's phone number, a number he had called or text, texted somewhere between 85 and 110 times in the last seven days. Rachel was uncomfortable dealing with a stranger on this occasion. After Gypsy left, the defendant said they should take this new friend out to lunch and talk to her about nursing. Rachel then expressed her discomfort with the situation and the defendant berated her for not being more kind to Jillian, a person who was in fact his mistress and lover, Gypsy Willis. Gypsy will tell you that this meeting at the temple was set up by the defendant who thought that Rachel meeting her at the LDS temple would be a good way to introduce her into the family. A few days after this and within a couple weeks of Michelle's death, the defendant assembled a nanny hiring committee consisting of Damian McNeil, his girlfriend Eileen Hang, and Vanessa McNeil. The defendant said that there were three to four applicants that were applying, but only one applicant was interviewed, Gypsy Willis. After Gypsy Willis was interviewed, the defendant came to talk to the members of the committee and said, what do you think? Should we hire her? Vanessa asked about the other applicants. The defendant stated that they had all canceled their appointments. By this time, some of the family had become suspicious that the defendant was having an affair with Gypsy Willis. Eileen Haynes suggested to the defendant that he not hire Gypsy Willis because of the turmoil and suspicion surrounding her. The defendant shrugged off Eileen's recommendation and said that he was sick of his children trying to run his life. Gypsy Willis was hired and brought into the home as the nanny. The defendant then called Alexis and told her he had found the perfect nanny and said her name was Jillian. Alexis questioned, Gypsy Jillian Willis, the person mom thought you were having an affair with? The defendant got angry and told Alexis not to come home. Defendant housed Gypsy in the basement of the home and placed a lock on her door reflecting to Rachel that he was a single man and did not want her to think he would come into Gypsy's room or act with any similar impropriety. Despite this, Gypsy Willis will tell you that their sexual relationship resumed soon after she came into the McNeil home. After she was hired, the defendant went around the neighborhood and introduced Gypsy again as Jillian. He said this was the person, the nurse he had been asking about housing options for and that she was going to be the children's nanny. And so things with her had worked out. 
the older McNeil daughters were frustrated with Gypsy Willis as the nanny because of concerns of an affair and also because they thought she was less than adequate in her performance as a nanny. They and others outside of the home began to notice that both defendant and Gypsy were leaving the house for days at a time and that their absences appeared to come at the same time. Weeks after Michelle's death, Gypsy Willis began looking for wedding rings. And soon after that, in July of 2007, the defendant officially proposed to Gypsy Willis in front of her family in Wyoming. The defendant then called Alexis and also told his other children that he and Gypsy were going to be married in the temple. Gypsy Willis and the defendant also began holding her out as Jillian McNeil, the defendant's new wife. Now you will hear that the original medical examiner, Dr. Maureen Fricke of the Utah Medical Examiner's Office determined that it appeared Michelle had died of a heart inflammation normally caused by a virus, a condition known as myocarditis. You will also hear from an expert in interventional cardiology, Dr. David Cragen, who will tell you that based on Michelle's medical history and most notably the lack of any symptoms associated with myocarditis, that this diagnosis in his expert opinion is unlikely and implausible. You will also hear from a renowned medical examiner, Dr. Joshua Perper, who reviewed Michelle's heart slides from the autopsy, and his testimony will be that myocarditis, which is a measurable and observable medical phenomenon, simply not there. Dr. Perper reviewed Michelle's autopsy and made the determination that she drowned. His opinion is based on the facts that Michelle was found in the bathtub, that she made gurgling sounds when CPR was first attempted on her, that she expelled three to four cups of liquid while CPR was being performed, and then expelled more frothy, bloody, and mucus-like liquid after that and that she also had heavy lungs. You will also hear from an expert in toxicology named Dr. Gary Dawson. Dr. Dawson will testify that the four drugs Michelle was found within her system when she died are all central nervous system depressants. And when introduced together, amount to a potent cocktail of medications that could produce profound central nervous system depression, especially in a drug-naive patient. The central nervous system depression, he would describe, could include symptoms like difficulty to arouse, loss of consciousness, respiratory depression, and coma. He will tell you that at the range of concentrations found in Michelle's blood after her death, these drugs would probably render a similar person unable to respond appropriately to their environment and would make that person unable to defend against threats to their safety. You will also hear from talk, Dr. Todd Gray, who is another medical examiner at the Utah Medical Examiner's Office. Dr. Gray reopened the case of Michelle's death and amended Dr. Fricke's opinion to include the cause of death of drug toxicity in addition to myocarditis. Dr. Gray will also tell you about the purpose and limits of a medical examiner's opinion and that his determination, like all medical examiners, is limited to what can be shown be up to a reasonable medical certainty and that medical examiners' determinations have to be tied to the body and the immediate circumstances of the death. Lastly, you will hear from five different people that the defendant spoke to about Michelle's death years after she had passed away. These people have checkered pasts, and most are inmates that are currently incarcerated. 
but they will tell you what happened to Michelle on April 11th of 2007 in the defendant's own words. The first will tell you that after he heard about Michelle's death, he approached the defendant about it. The defendant told him that Michelle was a bitch and that she had drowned, and while not admitting to the murder, told him that authorities could not prove a case against him. Similarly, he told another inmate that Michelle was a bitch, had drowned, and similarly never denied or admitted to killing Michelle, but stated that things happened and law enforcement could not prove a case against him. A third inmate will tell you that the defendant told him he was with his girlfriend before his wife's death and that his wife had had plastic surgery and that he gave her drugs and sleeping pills to get her to pass out and die and that he convinced her to get in the bathtub where he held her underwater to help her out. The defendant told this witness that it would be hard to prove it was murder because authorities could conclude his wife took too many medications and accidentally fell asleep in the tub. The defendant told another inmate that he had simply given Michelle too much medication and caused her death, stating again that law enforcement could not prove it was murder. Lastly, he explained to a final witness that he can get away with things and stated that one of the things he had gotten away with was killing his wife, that he was glad the bitch was dead. Prior to this, he had told another mistress, Anna Osborne, that he could kill someone in a way that it could not be traced because of his medical expertise. Now, as you have been told, this trial is likely going to last four to five weeks. Judge Poland has talked to you about use of notes and how they can help you remember things that are testified to. And you will be hearing from a number of witnesses. Their testimonies may overlap in what they say and in the timing and chronology of what they witnessed. But each will have an important piece of evidence to share with you. This case is a puzzle with many pieces. Pieces that are required to show you a complete picture of what happened to Michelle McNeil on April 11th of 2007. And at the conclusion of this evidence, Judge Pullen will again instruct you on the law and the charges for murder and obstruction of justice. He will tell you that murder in general terms is the intentional or knowing killing of another person or when another person creates a grave risk of death to another under circumstances evidencing a depraved indifference to the value of human life and the person dies. He will tell you that obstructing justice, again, in general terms, is where a person provides false information about a material aspect of an investigation or alters, destroys, or conceals evidence and does any of these with the intent to hinder, delay, or prevent a criminal investigation, prosecution, and conviction. And at the conclusion of all of the evidence and the instructions and the argument, we, as the state's attorneys, will come back up here and ask you to find the defendant guilty of murder and of, of obstructing justice. Thank you.